Over 1,700 new millionaires are created every single day in the U.S. alone, and more than double that across the globe. They're people from all walks of life, most of them people just like you and I. So the big question is this, how are so many people who didn't inherit money or have any special advantages overcoming the odds and becoming millionaires? That's the question, and this show will give you the answers. My name is Jeff Lerner, and welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Welcome everyone out there back to another exciting episode of Millionaire Secrets. And that ex- ex- when I say exciting, it's not an adjective, it's a promise. We're going to bring it here. Um, and today, I know we're going to bring it because I have with you Tim Story. If you uh, were at a, a recent 10X Growth Con, you know Tim Story. If you listen to the nationally syndicated Keep the Faith radio show, you know Tim Story. Uh, if you've checked out Oprah's Super Soul Sunday, you know Tim's story. There are a lot of ways that you will probably know Tim's story. And I'm just grateful and privileged that now one of those ways is the Millionaire Secrets show. So, Tim, welcome to the show. What a privilege. How did you come up with that name? I like the name of the, the show. How'd you come up with that? Well, you know, I thought, what's everybody out there looking for? Yeah. Secrets. Right? Secret. You know, the internet. So I come from the internet marketing world, right? And we're always looking for those magic little, little nuggets of copy that unlock, basically to get people to click stuff, right? And secrets is a powerful word. And then people want money. And, and I happen to think my message pretty directly impacts people's bottom line, though maybe not in the way that they think. And so I like sharing, you know, talking to successful people, figuring out how to make it really make it happen. And I like that because it's real. I think that in my journey, in conversations with some really bright people, you know, sometimes they give you like one secret that can really bring long lasting change. So I like, like that. Yeah. And that's, you know, I think it, it conditions people to go into these episodes the right way. You know, lots of, you think about like the seminar business is like three days of speakers and all, they bring you know, multi-sensory stimulation, but the reality is you're just going there to get that one thing. Yeah. And no uh, here I hope they're going to find, you're going to say a lot of amazing stuff. I have no doubt. I, I just hope that everybody gets one thing from Tim's story. So that's a great place to start. And, um, you know, let's, let's go there because we're here anyway. You've had an amazing journey and I want to I do more exploration of that journey. But if you had to pick one moment and one thing that, that, created the possibility for that moment that where your story shifted and you became the you that you are now today, what would, what would that be? I I think I'd have to go back to um, sixth grade, happy kid, good athlete, good dancer. I used to love soul train. You had American bandstand. They were okay. Dancers. Soul train were the better dancers. And uh, so I was a good dancer. It's in sixth grade. And I was a very good athlete. But uh, one day in sixth grade, my teacher um, said to me, hey, Tim, can you wait after class? So I did. And he said, "Um, I have like a personal library. And um, I wanted to see if you wanted to check out one of my books because I think you are, and I didn't know what he was going to say next. And he said, I think you are, then he said, brilliant. So I'd never had anybody say that to me before because my mother was very busy raising five kids. My father had passed when I was 10 in a car accident. So this guy who is a a white guy said, I think you are brilliant. And something that I now look back to that I'm glad I didn't push his words away. I embraced him. I said, okay. He said, so I'll give you three choices of books. And I took one by a man by the name of Irving Stone on the life of Michelangelo. And he said, well, well, how could that change you so much? Well, being raised, uh, you know, in Compton, California, we started seven people in a two bedroom house. When you would read a book like that, you, you would see beyond. You could see beyond. And so this book written by Irving Stone, who I later met as 
wife because he had passed. Uh, it really helped change my life in sixth grade, but, but also changed my life was the sixth grade teacher branding me brilliant. Hmm. He branded me and I went with it. Man, the, the power of, of early influence. My, my therapist says that we've all decided on our basic view of the world by the time we're anywhere between eight and 10 years old. And we spend the rest of our life just assimilating all the data that comes our way to fit it into that view. You know, I guess it's called a, some kind of bias, something, something bias, right? Uh, it's, just, we, it's how we look, cognitive bias. Well, there's all, yeah, I'm forgetting the exact term, but, but what a great bias to have. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so I think the cool thing was that he had observed me because this was towards the end of sixth grade. And I think he was right. And so I think we are all full of a lot of um, brilliance. And it's a matter of we respond to it and educate it and decide to manifest it. And so I did decide to do all three. Yeah, I mean, that word just it essentially refers to um, the projection of light. And I don't think, you know, you, I, I, as a fan of your, yours and now grateful to be a friend, I agree. I think you're brilliant. I've, I've followed you for a while, but I also don't think you have exclusive dominion on brilliance. I actually think, like you just said, we all have a touch of that. 100%. But it's 100%. Cool. It's cool that early on, you got somebody actually affirmed that for you and you decided to focus on that because, and you think about the power of that moment. What if he had, he had said, what, you know, hanging in the air, Tim, I think that you are struggling yeah and he could have really thought i would have really thought, thought, thought about that yeah right. you're exactly right because the the label the label creates a language and it's an interesting thing about a label a label is a tag or a marker that denotes three things it denotes the value of something value it denotes the use of something, okay? So value, usage, okay? And then it also is, um, uh, well, let's just leave it at two. I like it at two. It denotes two things, the value and the usage. Like if you were to put Louis Vuitton, then you say, hey, you know, that's valuable. If you put, um, this says water, but it's, if it said Sprite, it would be Sprite. So let's leave it two things. And so when he, when he labeled me brilliant, then he, he like said, hey, you're valuable. So mm -hmm. I went with that. I went with that. And the, and the usage, that. you know, what are, what are brilliant things intended for? They're intended for creation, uh, to cast light, to... to you know, illumination. Um, and by the way, the, speaking of language, I'm a language nerd and it was really bugging me. I couldn't think of that word, but confirmation bias is what I was reaching for earlier. Yes. Um, that now you've spent the rest of your life confirming that label. Yes. Uh, but over a period of time, you know, over a, a period of time of, of him first, you know, confirming the brilliance and then, for me to like, I responded to it. Remember what I said, I did not push it away. Yeah. So I, I teach this, that all of us are called to do something wonderful, but we have to cooperate with the calling. And so from famous actors, rappers, uh, artists, to guys who work at Amazon, to anybody that I work with, Everybody has a calling, but you have to cooperate with the calling. And I think that what the sixth grade teacher said to me, I was willing to cooperate with what he said. I see, I took the book mm -hmm. and then I read the book. And then he told me, tell me what you learned from the book. And I told him what I learned. See, so I cooperated. Well, it's interesting that that term and that book. And when you were, when you were saying that there were three things that a label connotes value usage where I, I, I had no idea. And, what and the, 
the th- no, the third one is the third one is content. Okay. The content. And so I thought it's content. You were and I'm gonna tell you why. It's content. And I'll tell you why. Because if I if this says water, I expect it to be water. If I if it says Disneyland, that's the label, I don't expect it to be Magic Mountain. So yeah, so I've been teaching on that for years. So it's 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 the value, the usage, how do I use something and the content. So it's essentially it's what's it worth, what's it for, and what's it what's in it. And 100%. so 100%. So if you're brilliant, what's it worth a lot, brilliant things are. What's it for? The term brilliance is about illumination, casting light, um, and what's in it is energy that projects. And so then it's interesting that you couple that with the book that you read, Michelangelo. What did Michelangelo do? Michelangelo, you know, his most famous creation, I would argue, is, is probably the Statue of David. Right. He didn't actually create David. What he did right. was he removed all the stone that was encasing David. That's awesome, actually. Right? And yet, Great and now thinking. you, as a coach who's brilliant, what do you do? with actors and rappers and executives and the people that you work with. You remove what's currently encasing them and allow their David to be illuminated by your brilliance. So that's super, super good. And so, you know, a lot of people have watched this um, ESPN special, uh, The Last Dance, Mm -hmm. that was originally supposed to be just about the Chicago Bulls, but they realized that that would only go so far. So let's make it about Michael Jordan. And so in that, you see Phil Jackson, that he had to do exactly what you said, because he had a cast of characters. He had Michael Jordan, who didn't need much work. He had Dennis Rodman, who needed a lot of work. He had Horace Grant, that was just a sturdy big guy in the center. Then he had like John Paxton, the... Uh, guard who was just a great shooter okay and so he had this interesting cast of characters Scottie Pippen and he had to somehow bring the brilliance out of every one of them and I'm glad we're going down this trail because we had not discussed what we're going to dialogue about is that I feel that you know all of us have our brilliance as you said but we need to build our brilliance. We need to build it. So whether you want to go the Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 hours to be a master at anything, but you have to build your brilliance. When I get around the best actors in the world, which I have been, I mean, I used to eat a lot of dinners with Tony Curtis, friends with Jack Lemon, Walter Matthau, so many um, dinners with Robert Downey Jr., probably over 100. Um, talking about acting and how to act, how to do a scene. These are people that built their brilliance. They built it. It's possible to build your, your brilliance. Yeah, I think it's, it's much more, it, it's, I think it's a, it's a neglected truth in most people's lives, not only how possible it is, but how many tools they have with which to do it strewn all around them if they look with those eyes and they'll and they'll do it and and you know sadly i think we live in a world that doesn't doesn't normalize this way of thinking yes and i think that's why people that are committed to excellence and brilliance and developing this best aspect of themselves so often end up as artists or athletes or entertainers or because those are those are actually kind of fringe things and, and unfortunately, the level of commitment to growth and, and the discipline required, uh, even, mili- even like special forces in the military, like these are like weird professions. Like when, you, when the, uh, you know, a girl comes home and tells her, her parents, Yo, I'm, I'm marrying a guy who wants to be a Navy SEAL or I'm marrying a guy yeah. who wants to be a professional actor. They're not normally like, yay, that's so awesome. He must be really committed to uh, brilliance and building is brilliance. They're usually like, well, are you sure about this? This may not be such a great idea. Those people tend to yeah. find themselves in these fringe places because they have a fringe way of living because sadly, building brilliance is like fringe. Yes. 
So right? let's go there for a second. So how does one discover what could be their brilliance? Many times it just pops out of you. I've seen brilliance in people who are just great listeners and they became great therapists. Mm -hmm. I've seen people that, that are very awkward, but they understand music and they became Pharrell Williams. So I think that it comes out of you when you're younger. And so for all you that are watching, if you, if you go back in your life and you start to pay attention to what you paid attention to, there lies your brilliance. I, I love that you're, yeah, I mean, your own life gives you clues about where it's meant to head. There's no I, doubt about it. I, I want to ask you a question. Um, you, it sounds like, had a very uh, fortunate, I wouldn't say lucky, but it was fortunate that at a certain moment as a child, you had the instinct or, or wherewithal for whatever reason to attach to a certain moment and draw a lot of meaning and identity from that moment that was actually uh, growth promoting, right? You didn't, yes. you didn't pick the wrong moment, you picked the right moment, right? What do you say to someone who 20 or 30 or 40 years later is realizing that they've spent decades in the grips of having chosen the wrong moment to attach to and, and you're, you're trying to help them unwind that and find a different label. How do you work with that? Because I suspect there's actually more of them than there are of maybe you and me. There's, there's much more of people who do that. And not to say that you and I are the prototype of people who have not been ensnared by snares <laughs> right because everybody's been through challenges but what happens is i mean this is this is what i became famous for um of uh, being a comeback coach um this is this is where my brilliance lies i'm not a great cook i'm an okay cook i'm not great at building cars but as a comeback coach they tell me that i probably cannot be beat and that's probably true so what happens is that when somebody has a setback and they can't figure it out, um, I actually wrote some steps down. Number one, you have to become awake, like wake up. Secondly, you take inventory. What happened in my life? Oh, my wife left me, okay. Awake, take inventory. Number three, you gotta find the right partners. And that's why people are partnering with you on this podcast. They're growing, they're learning, they're evolving. Number four, you got to make sure you find the right principles because the right principles will take you to the right place. The wrong principles will take you to the wrong place. Number five, you got to have the right plan. Again, this is where I'm super good. Hmm. Like I've helped some of the greatest actors in the world that we won't mention today get back on track and their plan sucked. And... Um, through a, a lot of conversations, they ended up like, holy schmoly. Hmm. So you gotta have the right plan. Number six, you have to have persistence. That's what you're about. The ability to push through. And number seven, you gotta stay on purpose, which is something that most people do not know how to do. Like some guys I life coach, I've life coached for over 20 years and they're highly successful. I was talking to one of the biggest agents in Beverly Hills, he said, Tim, you know, you've life coached me 22 years. And he has probably the two biggest celebrities that we can imagine. And I'm not exaggerating, the two biggest. 22 years I've life coached him. And so I said to him, what's one reason that you keep coming to me? He says, because you help me do what you say, stay on purpose. I don't feel like I'm going to go off my purpose, but I want to stay on my yellow brick road. So you become awake, take inventory, write partners, principles, plan, persistence, stay on purpose. So I have two questions. One is, are the right principles case by case? Or, you know, I mean, a lot of those are case by case. Strategy or the plan, partners, you know, depends on your situation. Are the principles case by case or are there a set of principles you always bring people back to? The principles are case by case, but I think it comes back to some Stephen Covey teaching of things like character, compassion, humility. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing this new thing where on Monday nights, uh, my guy Joseph 
have told you about. I call it the world shakers discussions. And I just discuss the hundred traits of the greats. And you see that most people that do well in life have similar principles, but they're very um, elementary, like character, humility, being mm -hmm. kind to others, compassion. Yeah. So yeah, they can come from a lot of different places. They can come from religion. They can come from Tony Robbins. They can come from a lot of places, but got to have core principles. Well, I love that you mentioned Stephen Covey. I, uh, <laughs> I'm a pretty big fan of the seven habits. Um, and, and I, yeah, I mean, if people are looking for a place to start, that's probably as good as any. No uh, doubt about it. And I think that what he has accomplished and the fact that his uh, work has uh, endured the test of time says a whole lot. But yeah, that's, that's an excellent book. Yeah, you, you, and, and to your point about building brilliance over time, you know, his seventh habit of, of you know, sharpening the saw, that if you're going to cut down a tree and you have five hours, you spend four hours sharpening your axe, right? Or sharpening your, whatever the, the metaphor is. That's that grind that nobody sees. Yes. And, and every one of your clients, you know, you're the, co you're the coach and they're the famous person with the coach. But there was a time long before when they were doing layer after layer and day after day of work. And I think that that's probably one of the, the saddest things about the time we're in now. I think the internet, because information moves so quickly and it's so accessible and people correlate information with success because they say, oh, if you have the right information, you can get the right result. And well, information moves quickly now. So if information moves quickly and information produces a result, therefore results should be produced quickly. Yes. And they just don't that's, give it uh, that's, that's a great observation by you. And the reality is to build something amazing takes a lot of time. And, you know, like the people I get to get around are just crazy, you know. Like I'm around Stevie Wonder. Yeah. To be Stevie Wonder um, didn't happen overnight. <laughs> it came from him hearing music, deciding he wanted to play the piano because he heard it, being blind, just working that craft over and over and over. But he told me I needed, I wanted a different sound and a tone. So I was talking to Verdine White from Earth, Wind and Fire, and he said, when Stevie plays piano, you know it's Stevie. When he plays harmonica, you know it's Stevie. Mm -hmm. Even though Bob Dylan was a great um, person on certain instruments, he sounds different than a, than a, a Stevie Wonder on harmonica. Mm -hmm. And so Stevie, by working hour after hour after hour after hour, building his brilliance, what did he do, man? He set up his family forever. Yeah. So that's, that, that's, that's what makes it so worth it for me. Like what people don't see behind the scenes is that I pay tens of thousands of dollars a year for information. And I hire all these psychologists, psychiatrists, and fact finders to bring me amazing information that I work on. And then I spit stuff all over the world that works. But I, I bust my butt to be authentic. Mm -hmm. So when someone says, dude, you just lit that stage on fire, it wasn't by accident. I, I got all that research and I put 30 hours into a 30 minute speech. Right. No wonder it worked. Yeah, I, I love, man, a couple things. Every, everything you say, I have like five ahas and questions from. So I'm, I'm like, picking and choosing, but a, a few things in what you just said. One is uh, the, the investment. You know, one of my core values, I, I teach about the three P's of excellence, physical, personal, and professional excellence. And one of my values is, what it isn't is we pursue physical, personal, and professional excellence. The value is actually we invest in physical, personal, and professional excellence. That, you know, okay. if you pay, you pay attention, right? And you talk about 
spending you know tens of thousands of dollars for information. I have a I I, I employed a staff of you know a, a content team, and I assign you know it takes three to five people to make this show happen. Yeah, and I started this show two months ago solely because I wanted to create relationships because relationships create opportunity. They give you access to better information. You, you, I mean, all the things True. that come from, from network, but it costs me you know, $10,000, $20,000 a month just to have a show where people can talk. So what's yeah. the value? Yes. I'm, not, I'm not here pitching my product. What's the value? The value is exactly what you said. It's investing in the different types of excellence. And, and I suspect you could have 100 people have this conversation and they would all have stories of how not only are they investing in, in information or excellence or communication or connection or you know, whatever the resources are now, but they were doing it even before they had money. They were just yes. investing whatever they had. Time. I like what you're saying. Yeah. But see, but that's why there's only certain people that have a certain sound or a tone and the world knows it. Like for instance, if you hear a song by Billy Joel, you go, whoa, that's Billy Joel. Right. Okay, the, the Rolling Stones, it's, that's the Stones. U2, that's U2. And what you have is a, a lot of people that are fast and fleeting today. That's not me, yo. I've endured the test of time. I've been at this 39 years now. Hmm. 39 years and still rising. So what is that? That is some mentors who sat on me, some guys that said, okay, Tim, you're a little charismatic. You're kind of smart, but you're not ready for this. Yeah. And let me just tell you something. Probably once a week, someone says to me, can you introduce me to Oprah Winfrey? Because I'm very close to her. I always think to myself, are they ready for her? Because she's pretty dialed in yeah. and man when you meet her for the first time you're gonna know you met her and i i'm telling you guys i'm around everybody from the dalai lama to deepak to everybody this lady is tuned in so the very thing they want the question is are they ready for it it's powerful stuff right mm -hmm, it is so I call it a three phase thing. Impartation, the idea comes. Incubation, the maturing of the idea and the maturing of the talent and the maturing of the person. So you have impartation, then you have incubation, then you have manifestation. As you said earlier, everyone's trying to manifest too, too fast. I'm not, there are certain things that I'm manifesting the heck out of, and I'm gonna be hard to beat in my lane, true. But there's new areas that I'm in, that I'm the newbie, mm -hmm. and I'm being trained by the best right now. I won't tell the areas, but I'm being trained by the best, because I'm a newbie in those areas, and I'm cool with that. I may not manifest heavy in those areas for seven more years. Man, I, I appreciate this conversation so much because selfishly, you are validating exactly what I'm doing right now. I've been an internet marketer for 12 years, done really, really well. I can walk into an event at ClickFunnels and have a bunch of people wanting to know how I did what I did. But, you know, starting this show and getting to meet people like yourself and, uh, I mean, I've Dave Asprey coming on the show next month, the creator of Bulletproof. And, it's, it's a totally different world for me. You know, the mainstream information and retail uh, marketing establishment world. I mean, it's, this is bi it's big. It's bigger than my whole I am bubble that I've lived in for a long time. And I'm actually trying, I, I meditate frequently on patience. And, and what you said, yeah. finding your voice. You know, Stephen Covey, after he wrote The Seventh Habit, published another book called The Eighth Habit, right? Oh, and yeah. Eighth habit was finding your voice, right? Yes, which is an excellent idea. But I think the thing that's cool about a person like yourself is that while you are building your spot, 
So here's a Tim story quote. Build your spot and life will put the spotlight on your spot. So when you build your spot, because you're so good at what you do, I could easily see you on like MSNBC with your own show. I mean, that's not beyond like where you're headed or on Vice or somewhere else that understands somebody who's super smart. So you build your spot and life will put the spotlight on your spot. Like it's a constant question to me where people say, uh, how do you get to know all these entertainers? I want to do the same thing. Um, We've never looked for one of them. Not one, not one. I got good at something and they needed that something. So I built my spot and life put the spotlight on my spot. So the better you get at what you're doing, which are very good, you're building your spot and life is going to put the spotlight on the spot. It's powerful. And I'll be honest, it's emotional to hear you say that. Um, but I've been fighting really hard. Fighting's not the right word. Training for it really hard to, to, to yeah, start but, doing but, what, but what's be, happening. But, but be emotional with it because I'm, I'm giving you some real crap here. Like, I won't say too much, but let me just say this. Charlie Sheen is my great friend. And I remember when he came to me and he said, they're thinking of me doing this show. And the show happened to be a show called Two and a Half Men. Mm-hmm. And he was considering not doing the show because he was a movie star. And I was one of the people, I can't say too much of the story because that's my boy. I've been with Charlie forever. So I can't tell too much of the story, but I was one of the few that said, TV is a smart idea because he was big screen. Mm -hmm. And I said, go small screen. Because I felt like, because he had so many setbacks that he needed to go and build his spot again. Be reliable, show up, know his lines. Well, over a period of time, he started making a million dollars an episode. Yeah, yeah, wow. And he's been very generous to me in many, many ways. So that's like Um, you said. Oh, sorry, go ahead, please. No, no, go ahead. Well, you mentioned, you know, I, th- I think you had seven or eight things and the last one was the plan. And you said, that's, that's kind of your, your specialty, right? And it sounds like at well, least stay Charlie on purpose. Sheen certainly benefited from that, right? Yeah, I mean, to stay on purpose, you got to become awake, take inventory, you have the right partners. We're talking about a comeback. Mm-hmm. You got to find your right principles, have the right plan, persistence, but you got to stay on purpose. And what you have to be careful of is the bigger you get, there's more shiny objects that will come your way. And the people who stay great, like Tom Hanks as an actor, my friend Denzel Washington as an actor, they're not much for chasing the shiny objects. Oprah Winfrey has been in her house since March because she doesn't want to get COVID-19. You, you're not going to get Oprah with a shiny object. <laughs> So people are always trying to picture something shiny. Mm -hmm. No, man, she got too good on staying on purpose. And so it's that, it's that very thing that you think is not working that makes you brilliant. Like for instance, I have a brother four years older than me and he used to build model airplanes and model cars. And I thought, what a waste of damn time, you know, cause I was, I was more of the athlete. He was a, he was a good athlete, but I was an athlete. And that guy is like 12 building model cars. Well, I didn't know that was going to lead him to become an engineer at McDonnell Douglas. Hmm. You get my point? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he was building a spot. Yeah. And life put the spotlight on a spot. So what's interesting to me about that concept, and, and by the way, I'm going to be riffing on this building your spot idea for a long time because I love it. I'm, I'm going to be talking to my mastermind group about it and so forth. Yeah, do it. Um, 
is is I, I think a lot of times in the in the building of the spot, people don't realize it's a spot that they're building. They 100%. just think, they think it's just life happening to them, and they're being resilient, and they're doing all the they're applying these principles that they've heard. But I know a lot of times it's hard to see the forest amidst the trees, right? Yeah. How do you so, keep people on task in that when they can't see what they're actually pulling off? I think a lot of it is about motives. So we have about seven minutes right, left. Right. And I think that it's a lot about, is about motives. Like I don't have whack motives. <laughs> like I didn't look for money. Money came to me because I became good at what I did. I didn't try to move to Beverly Hills and have seven bathrooms and an elevator. That happened to me um, because I became super good at what I do. I don't have whack motives at all. I do a lot of stuff for free. Um, I'm on a lot of boards for free to help people out. I sometimes speak for fee, free, even though my speaking fee to corporations is super high. So I don't have whack motives. And I think a lot of people, your motives are whack. They're not right. Mm. And what happens is that you want it so bad. Mm. So people could look up to you. Dude, that's overrated. You know, to be a celebrity means to be celebrated. Celebrate your damn self. Yeah, look, and, and I look up to you for what? For, for yeah. look up to you for wanting to be looked up to? I mean... There should be more. Yeah. Right. Good point. Good point. <laughs> like do something worth celebrating and then maybe humbly and patiently, uh, you know, seek a little bit of, of at least validation that could maybe grow into celebration, but do something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and the interesting thing about life is that like, like young people may know more about, um, Taylor Swift and know nothing about Prince. I was talking to my friend's son and I was saying, yeah, I like Prince. I like him because he, he was his own guy, created his own brand. And he literally said, and the kid's 15, he said, who's that? Hmm. It's Prince. Yeah. So, so, so you can be Prince and still some people don't know you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting because you think of Taylor Swift and, and I don't, I've never met her. I'd love to meet her. And I think she clearly has some intangibles that have given her some sticking power in an era where sticking power is, is rare. Um, but you have a million people competing to be the next Taylor Swift. Yes. But nobody's competing to be the next Prince. Right. Because the next Prince is a contradiction in terms. Hey. Good going. That's, that's some good stuff right there. And the other thing about Prince is that he built a spot where he learned to play as many instruments as he could in case the lazy ass people didn't show up. That's what he told a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. He said, I was, I was tired of waiting for the drummer who didn't show up. And I had to lay down a drum segment. And if so, that lazy guy didn't show up. I knew I could do it myself. This is such brilliance. Yeah, really. That, that, that Prince could play so many different instruments in case he needed to. But a lot, like a lot of times he never played them. But just in case he needed to. See, I, I think that's so hot. Yeah, that is, that is pretty epic. As a former professional working musician, <laughs> I very well understand the issue he was dealing with and it was one of the reasons i was always grateful to be a piano player because literally if nobody else showed up <laughs> it's a solo instrument by design right so i could cover yeah. all the parts um that's so that's so cool listen i know that uh we both have a, a another appointment coming up so i want to uh, end this what i think is on a, a wonderful high note right here um and and i just am so grateful i appreciate you you being here and making this connection and what i will not ask you when we when we get off is to introduce me to Oprah, but what I would ask you, and you've, you've helped me realize this, what I would ask you is when I, when I am ready, would you introduce me? And frankly, much more importantly, what, what would I need to do to get ready, right? Like that's the question. 
Yeah. Uh, I, and I'm I not think, asking I, you now. I'm just, I'm letting that hang in the air for- No, no, of course. No, no, I like the way you think. I think that the, whether it be that lady we just mentioned or somebody else, mm -hmm. you're doing what you should be doing at this point. You are building your spot. That's, yeah, that's such a great and, concept. That's the yeah, one thing, and we, right? That's that the one thing. Yeah. No doubt. And for so, everyone. So with every, with every guest that you interview, with all the research that you're doing before you interview us, you're building your spot. And then what happens with a lot of different people, because like this is what happens to me on the weekly basis where uh, I'll get a call from an entertainer and they'll tell me about another big, big entertainer that needs to talk to me. And I don't even ask why, because they need what I'm good at. Mm -hmm. I'm a master of the comeback, not kind of good. Mm -hmm. I'm a master. So, so, so they're looking for that. So I'm just, I'm just here in COVID-19 Ville with all kinds of books and stuff. Right. Right. And all this stuff's coming at me. I mean, if you knew the two people I talked to today already, I ain't looking for it. I'm well, building cool this is you're building spot, your spot right here. You're building, building your spots. Spot. Even though your spot is pretty, pretty illuminated, you're still building it. I love that about you. Listen, in the interest of time, I know we're, we're about out of it. How do people come enroll into your world? So that's nice of you. So we offer this little thing that I think is kind of cool. And I, I'm doing this on purpose because my life coaching is expensive. I'm $1,000 an hour. So you don't want to do that. But we do this thing for $19 a month where watch how cool this is. Every Monday night I get on zoom and I have conversations with people with other people who I call world shakers, $19 a month, mm -hmm. no upselling you, no come into my deeper place. Right. And I go over the, hundred traits of the greats and you have people that are running worlds entertainers factory workers it's one of my favorite things i've ever done so it's conversations with other world shakers you go to timstory.com and maybe your people can put that on so yeah yeah we'll put that in the link i know that you're also tim story official on instagram on instagram yeah i'm so jeff learner official on instagram so i'm glad we're both official um, yes, <laughs> we've we've put together a link, uh, millionairesecrets.com slash Tim S. That hey, I want nice. I want to invite people to that where they can actually get our uh, free ebook on the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy. It's called the Millionaire Shortcut. Uh, nice. Make sure we know that you got there by listening to this episode. So go to millionairesecrets.com. No, so definitely. So when you guys sign up, because they do sign up for this, because mm -hmm. it's only $19 a month, and I'm on every Monday night myself, not like 19 of my associates. Right, cool. To me, it's therapeutic, and I get to give back. And why do you even put a value on it? Number one, it's $19. And people need to value it so they pay a little something to feel good about everything. But uh, so when you sign up, make sure and let it know it's through this program and then they'll get your free book. Is that correct? Yeah. The Millionaire Shortcut. Uh, they can. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure we'll figure that out. But yes, it, they're entitled stuff. to it. Hey, Tim, thank you so much for being a guest on Millionaire Secrets. I, it's been great having you. What a privilege. And listen, let me just say this to you in parting. I'm proud of you. And uh, because you're already kicking butt, taking names in your in your lane. So now you stepped out into this other lane and you're just going to do the same thing. Just so you know, you're going to do it again because you learn to build your spot here. You are just helicoptering it to another place. So congratulations. Well, from you, that means a lot, Tim. Thank you uh, to yourself and to the entire millionaire secrets audience out there. Go enroll in Tim's world and his coaching thing sounds amazing. So uh, check that out too. And I'll bid everyone farewell. Thank you, Tim. Life is good. Thank you for watching Millionaire Secrets. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and leave us a comment below. 
And don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you know whenever we release a new episode. Also, if you want to learn the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy, click the link in the description below to claim your free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut. And don't forget, Millionaire Secrets is available on all the major podcast platforms as well. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you can listen on the go. Thanks for watching.